hands and I, I and we are recording this um this workshop so if you do not want to um be recorded then there's a prompt to leave the meeting um I have been the horticulture chair and a member of CMPS my Baker for about 12 years now and it's so exciting to come to uh, present with you with a group that I've been very proud to work with um, called the Resilient Landscapes Coalition. And Ellie Inslee, who is not feeling well tonight and not able to join us, um, came to me um, from Sonoma Ecology Center a couple of years ago, maybe a few years ago at least, um, uh, um, concerned about what was happening with the with residential landscapes and the urban wildlife interface in in coordination with um, fire work and land, you know, uh, land use clearing and all kinds of things. So she wanted to bring us all together to start thinking about with firefighters and with fire organizations, um, thinking about how we can work in our zero to 100 space between, but from our home and create Firewise, biodiverse landscapes that are drought resistant. So, thinking about all these pieces. And at the time, I've been working with Mimi Enright from the UC Master Gardeners already on some projects. And they had really been leading this deep dive into the codes and what needs to be happening, and already spent at least a year or two ahead of us already researching this work. So, we've spent a lot of time. Um, creating what you're going to be presented to um, with John Kanegi, who is a new hire at Snowy Ecology Center, who has a lot of background in land restoration and, and vineyard management and um, working. He has his degree in landscape architecture. So we're excited to have John give you the gist of the work in our workshop. It's usually a two hour workshop, but we've, we've dialed it down to, you know, 45 minutes or so with a with an ample amount of questions. Um, and so um, we, we will have some question and answer time after we, Mimi and I will also be working with the chat. So I'm going to hand it over to John and so we can get to the heart of this presentation. And then Mimi and I and Jennifer from UC um, Property Extension as well will be helping you guys with questions and seeing where we need to go. John, take it away. Okay, thank you, April. Uh, let me get the wheels moving here, sharing screen. Okay, um, yes, again, thank you, April. Thank you, uh, Wendy and Leah for the, the invitation and the, and the welcome here. Thanks everybody uh, at the Milo Baker uh, chapter of the California Native Plant Society. I'm so happy to be here. I kind of wish that we could be uh, all together. That would be a lot of fun. I look forward to doing that again, but it is great that uh, at least we're able to get together virtually, everybody uh, everybody safe and, and comfortable and, and saving lots of fuel and things by not driving around. Um, again, my name is John Kanegi from Sonoma Ecology Center, and I'd like to speak tonight about resilient landscaping in the defensible space zone. And we have as a, a subtitle for this program, uh, Garden as if Life Depends on It. And I'll try to make the case that we really have a, a, a critical uh, time here where we've lost so much uh, wild land that we need to take advantage of ourselves as gardeners of our opportunity to work in our, on our own small properties uh, to continue to uh, create, increase uh, habitat and biodiversity. Uh, as it's critically important that we do that and also sequester carbon and, uh, and work towards uh, moderating climate change. Um, I'll speak here first, but I'm, I'm just a member here of a, of a group that is called the Resilient Landscapes Coalition um, that April mentioned. There's our, our website on the screen and let me um, introduce other members. Unfortunately, um, uh, Ellie Inslee is, as April said, under the weather today and so not with us, we'll miss her. Uh, Ellie was, uh, is a, a member of the board of directors of Sonoma Ecology Center um, and developed within that organization our Resilient Landscapes Coalition uh, that hired me uh, in the spring of this past year uh, to join her. And uh, she comes from a background of landscape architecture and, uh, and restoration. Um, and I 
John, somehow you've been muted. I see that. Uh, okay, you thank you. Good can to you go. hear me now? Yeah, we sure can. Okay, shall I start over with this slide? Uh, no, it just happened just a second ago. Okay, so uh, my name is John Kanegi uh, with Sonoma Ecology Center for the past seven or eight months. Come from a background of horticulture and landscape design. I was also a vineyard manager in, uh, in, in Napa and Sonoma counties for about 15 years. Um, the other members of the Resilient Landscapes Coalition founding members are UC, the UC Master Gardener Program of Sonoma County, uh, Mimi Enright, <clears throat> excuse me, who just spoke, um, heads up that program. Uh, and Jennifer Roberts uh, joined the group in this past year as well, assisting with this Resilient Landscapes Coalition. She's with us here tonight. Uh, April Owens, many of you know and, and just spoke from Habitat Corridor Project and her own uh, landscape design firm, April uh, Owens Design. And a, a critical member has been Roberta McIntyre. She heads up the nonprofit Fire Safe Sonoma that helps uh, Sonoma County residents with uh, fire risk reduction, fire preparedness, and that sort of thing. The, um, oops, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, um, I was trying to remove this, uh, the bar, the menu bar at the bottom of my screen, but I don't seem to be able to, it was covering uh, that. But it, the, uh, the last part of that slide pointed out that this, uh, the presentation in our work uh, is done in accordance with uh, fire officials and, and has uh, their blessing. Often when we do our longer webinars, uh, we have a member of the fire, um, fire protection community with us also to field questions and that sort of thing. Uh, we believe that a firewise landscape with careful selection, placement and maintenance of plants and other materials can provide biodiversity, habitat and beauty. And so part of our uh, program, which is all around education for defensible space is around, um, around this notion of landscapes that not only are firewise, but that also have a rich diversity of plants and provide a lot of ecological services. We were seeing um, some messaging out there and people responding uh, where plants are removed almost to the point of having no plants in the landscape, just rocks and, and boulders and things and really creating a bit of a moonscape that doesn't provide a lot of beauty or, uh, or habitat. So that's where we're coming from. And here's a quick outline of the presentation. Uh, that we have for you tonight. Well, I'll start with ecology and sustainability, uh, move into design and maintenance principles, and then some examples of planting and maintenance. Um, and then I'll point out uh, again, I think it may have been mentioned that um, I'll be, although I'll speak here uh, for about 30 minutes or so first, uh, the rest of the group that's with us will, will form a panel to respond to questions and to, uh, to clear up any of the uh, uh, murkiness that I may have left behind. Uh, during the presentation, either directly or, or indirectly, I hope to dispel some myths and answer some questions, like how do we avoid creating a moonscape and creating a firewise landscape? Uh, and do we have to cut down our trees? And what are the best fire resistant plants? So we'll hope that those get covered. And I'm going to start with some basic principles. These are really the, um, the guidelines that you should come away with, uh, come away from the presentation with. So I'll, I'll point them out all out here, but they'll also they'll come up during the during the talk, and, and hopefully it's what you walk away from uh, at the end of the evening. You want to start at the house and work out uh, if you're in a fire, uh, a wildfire risk uh, environment. You don't want to start your work out in the in the forest or even in the landscape, but start at the house, harden the house, as they say. Uh, and work out into the landscape as you have the time and the, and the uh, resources to do so. Uh, I'll talk a, a bit more about that in a moment. We're going to implement a zero to five foot zone around the house called the Ember Defense Zone. Um, a little bit farther out from the five foot zone, we're going to create islands of plants with non-combustible paths or other landscape elements that are non-combustible between these groupings or islands of plants to interrupt the path of fire, sort of just little uh, fire breaks in the landscape. Uh, I will emphasize that maintenance is absolutely essential. We're going to design, first of all, with maintenance in mind so that we don't design uh, a planting and creating situations that are just you know, too difficult to, uh, to maintain. And we'll regularly maintain and hydrate plants. We want to use science to inform our decisions. And there's, there's science around wildfires and why houses burn and things like that. There's, there are scholarly articles, lots of folks working uh, from the University of California and other, other institutions. And we use that science to inform these decisions, but um, the information is, uh, is ongoing. And so there, there are changes and modifications sometimes to the, the recommendations. Okay, 
first off a bit about ecology and sustainability. I want to remind you that there are uh, ecosystem services that are provided in the defensible space. Defensible space refers to the landscape around, uh, around your home or around a structure. It usually extends out to about 100 feet. Uh, is that, that area around the house that we're really going to concentrate on. Some ecosystem services that are provided in, in our gardens include biodiversity, include enriching the soil and holding it in place, keeping it protected, providing um, uh, not only habitat, but food for soil uh, organisms and microorganisms. We're going to clean and manage stormwater um, using the, the um, uh, sort of the practice of slow it, spread it, sink it, and store it. So slow down uh, stormwater that falls on the, on the house or on the property, on the roof or on the property. We're gonna spread it out, then we're gonna sink it into, uh, into our, onto our own property and store it there, rather than letting it rush into the street and down the drain and into the nearest creek. Uh, plenty of water uh, gets into our creeks from streets and parking lots and things like that. What falls on our own property, we should try to keep on our property. Also sequestering carbon is something of critical importance during this time of climate change and something that we can contribute to. Uh, in our own home landscapes. Supporting pollinators, super important with the, the plight of the Western monarch uh, and, and you know, thousands of other species uh, of insects and other invertebrates that, uh, that need some help. Okay, we'll dig a little bit more deeply into the question of biodiversity and habitat. I have up here just a little fact that between 1982 and 2001, 34 million acres of wild land were lost to development in the United States. That's an area about the size of the state of Illinois during that time. That was a while back and, and the rate of loss, unfortunately, is accelerating. The image shows a, an image of the United States at night. So all of the, the lights represent the development uh, across our country. And you, know, you, can, you can see from that just the, the sort of the amount of wildlands, especially in the eastern half of the nation and along the west coast that has been lost uh, to development. Um, so we need to intervene here. This is where um, we're reminded that to garden as if life depends on it because built landscapes or our designed landscapes do make a difference. And there are some things that we can do uh, creating habitat in our design landscapes. We wanna think about what, um, what wildlife needs uh, and, and work to provide that. We wanna choose native plants. I don't think this uh, will be a difficult argument with this group. Choose native plants most of the time. We need numbers 70 or 80% of the time. That allows us to have uh, you know, some fruit trees or a very special uh, you know, rose bush or camellia that uh, you know, maybe was something from, a, uh, from our grandmother, that, you know, that sort of thing. We can have some non-native plants, but choosing native most of the time will really do a great deal uh, to create habitat. We want to plant in islands or groupings of plants, um, clusters of plants to provide habitat, cover food and nesting sites. A single plant on its own uh, often just does not, uh, you know, cannot provide a, the same kind of habitat that a grouping, a small island of plants can do. But we'll, we'll learn how to organize or, or, or place these islands so that, um, that the fire risk is not too great. We'll utilize integrated pest management. And again, I'm gonna try to, uh, here we go move this into a little menu bar out of the way uh, so I can see the rest of my slide. We'll utilize integrated pest management to minimize pesticide use and make the, um, make the garden safer for uh, uh, invertebrates and invertebrates for that matter. And we'll provide a water source as often that's a, a limiting factor for, uh, for a, lo a lot of wildlife. I want to encourage you to um, to think about this very compelling notion of a web of life, uh, the interconnectedness of different species of animals and plants. Uh, I encourage you to approach this with you know, sort of renewed curiosity, you know, like a child might have uh, in learning new things. I just put together a little collage uh, to you know, remind me of some of the interactions that I find so fascinating and so important. I'll start down here. I'm not sure if you can see the cursor, but I'll start down here in the bottom right where you see um, some, some squiggly little worms. Uh, these are in fact worms. They're, they are round worms uh, called nematodes. Uh, and they are familiar to me because this is uh, a group or some, some uh, species of nematodes that I worked with as a graduate student in doing some graduate level research. These are entomopathogenic nematodes. Nematodes are little, uh, often microscopic uh, worms that live either in the soil or really on the, the films of moisture around soil particles. Um, these particular ones, uh, they have many different 
functions um, uh, as, as parasites or uh, living on organic matter and, and different things. But these particular ones are parasites of insects. They will enter the bodies of insects that are in the soil, um, release a bacterium from their gut into the insect, killing it. And that provides uh, you know, nutrition and, and a place for reproduction for the nematode. Uh, they can be used, therefore, as a natural enemy or a biological control of insect pests. Rather interesting. Over here to the left, also still underground, uh, mycorrhizal fungi are, are receiving lots of, um, of excitement these days, lots of new information about mycorrhizal fungi and how they contribute to plant health and, and uh, you know, possibly communication between plants. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, interesting things that we can learn there and some good books on that subject. Coming up above ground, uh, um, I'll remind us all that oaks are almost everywhere that they occur, and they occur all over the country, different species, of course, but uh, almost everywhere they occur, including here, oaks are really a keystone species, a species that has so much interaction with other, uh, with other animals and with plants um, that we consider them a keystone species. Um, they, there's more than 5,000 invertebrates in California that have some interac interaction with oak trees including a couple here, uh, weevils that, um, that lay their eggs inside the uh, acorns uh, and the developing larvae eat those acorns, the larvae come out and then are a food source for others. Uh, caterpillar pests of uh, oaks, I say pests, but you know, they're herbivores, but um, for the very large part, uh, insects that feed on oak trees and other native plants, if they are a native insect, um, are not going to, um, to debilitate the plant. Of course, there are some exceptions to that, but they are very few compared to the number of, of insects that, um, that will find uh, you know, resources from an, from an oak tree. These animals, um, these invertebrates are tremendous food source for many other animals. Uh, birds, for example, uh, will eat uh, these caterpillars or, or other, the other insects that visit oaks. Uh, birds will take acorns. Um, even birds that uh, we would normally consider to be seed eaters that, that come to bird feeders uh, during the spring season when they're raising their young uh, caterpillars and other insects are an extremely important food source for them. So I encourage you to look into this if it's been some years since you have uh, dug into a, a book on ecology. In fact, I have a couple to recommend and perhaps one of the other members of the coalition could type into chat uh, the, the names of these books or the author's name is Douglas Tallamy. Uh, he is an, eco an entomologist uh, and ecologist from the University of Delaware, who's done some great writings on interactions between native plants and, uh, and native uh, wildlife. Uh, this first book uh, that I read is called Bringing Nature Home. Again, the author is Douglas Tallamy. Uh, and another book that I've just started recently is called The Nature of Oaks. Uh, the only unfortunate thing is that he comes from the East Coast. He's a professor at the University of Delaware. And so his examples tend to come from from the east and not from California, but uh, we'll just have to, to uh, find our own examples here. So I encourage you to uh, continue to think more about the web of life, keeping trees healthy, protecting roots, utilizing or recognizing that oak leaf litter or other leaf litter supports micro microorganisms and root systems of plants. Uh, and then just a little bit more on ecology, what with uh, climate change, such an important um, factor. I wanted to say something about the role of plants in sequestering carbon. Uh, in a year, a mature tree will absorb more than 48 pounds of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and release oxygen in exchange. Of course, that creates the carbon cycle where uh, plants, all plants, but you know, large trees do it just that much more because of their, their biomass, uh, will um, take in carbon dioxide, use that as their carbon source for building cells, um, release oxygen in exchange, that carbon is throughout the plant. What's in the root system often makes its way into the, into the soil and is, uh, and is stored there as organic matter as cells uh, slough off of roots and, and decay there. Uh, let's remember that um, without plants, we do not live. Uh, plants are absolutely critical for the survival of everything else. Everything uh, depends on plants. We either eat them or we eat the things that eat plants. So we wanna take care of them. Uh, again, built landscapes can make a difference in this area. Key actions would be to plant, uh, but also to pr preserve uh, mature oak trees as uh, a seedling just cannot, you know, it takes many, many years before it can uh, provide this service that a mature oak and other uh, uh, native trees can do. We want to keep organic matter on the property as much as possible to sequester carbon. Um, I like to compare this to how 
people are often very good about conserving water by when they do dishes, for example, they'll take the, they'll collect the rinse water and take it out into the garden to water plants. That's great. I wonder if we can think about doing that same sort of thing, but with carbon so that what organic matter is produced on our, uh, on our properties that we try to keep it on the property as much as possible. In other words, make compost piles, uh, if it's possible to have chickens in your uh, in your yard as as we do in ours, uh, that's a great way to keep um, you know the larger things that come out of the garden, the tomato vines and the corn uh, stalks. I find it a little bit hard to work with those in in our compost pile, uh, but putting them in the chicken yard where they can uh, kick and scratch and and peck through them uh, helps break those down. What is still hard uh, is with the woody material. You prune the fruit trees. It is hard to keep that woody material uh, on your property short of having a chipper shredder, uh, which is not a step I've wanted to take yet. Uh, but th this idea of keeping carbon on, the, on your own property benefits us because any time we put things in, the, in our yard waste bins, which is a great idea, but that takes uh, you know, burning fossil fuels to get that to a big uh, central facility where they make compost and then burning fossil fuels to get it back out uh, to customers, things like that. I think we should try to keep it at home as much as we can. Also, a uh, key action would be to um, use organic mulch where it's appropriate, and it is not appropriate everywhere, as we'll discuss. It, it contributes to soil health, conserves moisture, and prevents erosion. Okay, let's get into the into the uh, the idea of defensible space, designing landscapes for reducing fire risk. This uh, this diagram shows the three ways that houses may burn, structures may burn during a wildfire event. Um, from top to bottom, they would be that a wildfire could produce embers. Uh, it does produce embers. Uh, bits of, of burning material that float around, fly around with the winds, will land on the property, uh, will land on, on the roof oftentimes because that's a large uh, area of the property. And if there is debris there, uh, can ignite it. It floats through the landscape as well, and plants can play two different roles. They can uh, sort of block that, uh, sort of absorb it, if you will, uh, and allow those embers to burn out. And they'll do that if the plant is relatively you know, green and well hydrated. If there's a lot of dead material, dead leaves in it or under it, um, then that can contribute to, uh, to combustion. Um, because embers are so important, the, the fact that the embers burn up against the house uh, that becomes a very important uh, area for us to work, and we'll get into that here in a moment. Uh, the other, uh, another way is that radiant heat can cause a structure to burn. This is where the heat is so great. You know, you imagine holding your hands up to a campfire, and you get too close, and you will in fact burn. Uh, this is uh, that can be the source of burning uh, for a house if, and say, a neighboring house or a, a large tree, for example, uh, is on fire, and that radiant heat starts starts our building uh, ablaze. And then finally, direct flame contact can occur where if you imagine a forest is burning tree to tree to tree and then into the landscape, tree to a shrub up to the house um, and, and catching the house on fire that way. That is a possibility too. But of these three embers, as is stated uh, here in the text, embers cause the great majority of structure fires during wildfire events. And so recognizing that uh, helps us strategize. Um, with it, it, it um, is good to, uh, to emphasize that we should first harden the home. We should think about um, what the, the building materials are, uh, screens on vents, uh, double pane windows, things like that. Um, and then after we've done what we can do with the house, then we'll work out into the landscape. I'll point out that the source for this information comes from um, a fairly recent article, Reducing the Vulnerability of Buildings to Wildfire. Vegetation and Landscaping Guidance from the University of California Ag and Natural Resources Department. Uh, so here's a, um, a little diagram of a house and landscape, and that allows us to talk about defensible space zones. Again, we're gonna start at the house and work out. The first zone that we'll work in is called zone zero, and it is just the, the space that's zero to five feet from the structure. Sometimes this is called the ember, um, sorry, the ember defense zone. Zone one is uh, five to 30 feet from the structures. We call that the lean, clean, and green zone. Uh, and we'll talk about why, 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 it's, uh, why it's called that and what our strategies will be there. Zone two would be from 30 to 100 feet from structures. A Couple of things to point out here, really there should be a zero to five feet zone around the garage as well as a five to 30 feet. Would complicate the diagram a bit, but that would be more accurate as we really need to consider all of the structures on the property, not just the house. And also, 
uh, I have a note to remind me to, uh, to, to mention to work with our neighbors because oftentimes our neighbors are close enough that our say zone uh, two, 30 feet to 100 feet might fall within five to 30 feet of their house. So it would be their zone one. So we wanna work with our neighbors and, and you know, respect them with uh, treating their zone one, even if it's on our property uh, appropriately. Okay, so we'll start with zone zero, zero to five feet from structures. And some design points here are that we want to minimize or eliminate plants completely and other flammable materials uh, in this zone with no plants, particularly under windows. So this is not a place to store uh, you know, firewood or lumber or something like that. And it's um, appropriate to remove uh, most or, or even all of the plants from here, depending kind of on the, um, the risk factors of where you are and the house, uh, the building materials, things like that. We want to use only inorganic and non-combustible mulches. So we also don't want to have on the ground a wood mulch in this area. Uh, hardscape and walkways like we see here in this photo uh, are ideal in this zone. Uh, if it's not desirable to have or not necessary to have a walkway there, then maybe it's just a, an area of gravel along, um, along the, the house in that area. When lawns are eliminated, the need for foundation plants is removed. So this idea of having foundation plants lined up along the house um, is, is a convention in our country. And so this is a deviation from that. I think where that comes from is that lawns were also a convention in our country and they're, they're um, pleasingly beginning to disappear as people convert to uh, more, more drought tolerant landscapes. But I think when people have a lawn, they kind of need the foundation plantings as sort of a backdrop for that. But um, as we move the interesting plantings out away from the house in, into what used to be the lawn, then it really um, you know, allows, it to, allows us to have much more flexibility in the zero to five foot uh, zone. Uh, wood fences often are part of a landscape and they should not connect directly to the house because that would put uh, you know, wood and a flammable material right in the zero to five foot zone. Uh, we can avoid this, perhaps it's not even necessary that the fence connect completely to the house, but if it is necessary, then that last panel can be of some other non-flammable material, perhaps metal or a cement board or something like that, or there is a gate in that area and that gate could be uh, you know, made of metal, for example. All of this comes um, from the fact that uh, often, again, embers are the source of uh, structure fires during a wildfire event and those embers will blow often right up to a house. You know, imagine like snow flurries or something. They blow around and they'll accumulate uh, in places where the wind uh, is a little bit less. And so we want to avoid the buildup of, de of debris um, that serves basically as tinder along the, uh, the, along the base of the house. And so that's the reason for minimizing or eliminating plants and keeping it super clean. So the maintenance would be to clean up clutter and debris, uh, might be you know, furniture, the pallet that I sometimes have been known to lean against the, the wall of the garage. Uh, we don't want that in this zone. Uh, we'll regularly remove fallen leaves and needles, whether they come from the you know, very nearby plants or inevitably, no matter what plants you have in your landscape, uh, some, some needles and leaves are gonna blow in from, uh, from the neighborhood. If plants are in this zone, we want to keep them very sort of thin and maintained meticulously. So we're going to thin them out so that we can get behind them easily so that there is not dead material in them, no dead leaves, no uh, dead twigs, uh, and we'll avoid buildup of plant debris within and under the plants. Now trees may overhang the roof, but keep clearance of at least five feet from the roof. So don't think of this as just a, a zero to five foot zone on the ground, but also sort of like a five foot bubble that goes all the way around the house. And it needs to be 10 feet from chimneys. That's just part of fire code. Uh, if trees do overhang the roof, we want them obviously to be uh, healthy and not have dead wood and you know, the risk of, of uh, fallen limbs. Um, but even more than that, we want to remove that litter from the roof really regularly, especially during fire season. Here's a couple of examples of, uh, of zero to five foot uh, landscapes. Um, some photos by Ellie, a design over here on the right by April Owen. So we're seeing other uh, creative um, pathways using um, hardscaping to, um, to, to create some interest, um, but with a plant free, largely uh, zero to five foot zone. The middle photo just chooses to use um, a sort of a swath of gravel along the, along the home that's very 
um, very practical. You can see how, you know, if there were plants uh, under the windows, in this situation I feel in my own house, I want to be out with the plants. When I'm in the house, I have to be, I want to see the landscape from the windows. And so it is perfectly fine for me to have that landscape moved out away from the house where I can actually enjoy it. Um, so I kind of think of it as being having two faces. It's facing the window so I can enjoy that, but the landscape also may face you know, the street if that's the case or a sidewalk uh, and, and faces that direction. This photo shows use of a, <clears throat> excuse me, a more narrow swath of gravel uh, plants. Well, uh, you know, minimal use of plants and, and placed uh, away from the house so that it's easy to get around them, maintain them uh, and clean up behind them. Okay, we'll move into zone one, five to 30 feet from structures. Here we are able to do some planting. We're gonna group the plants in islands and separate those islands with pathways to break the path of fire. The groupings of plants will provide so much more habitat for wildlife than just single plants uh, can do. We'll rely mostly on small shrubs and perennials, just to three feet or so. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, just the lower plants are gonna be mean, bi less biomass, less material to burn. So a smaller fire, a less hot fire if it were to if it were to catch on fire. Also, it allows firefighters, if they're approaching the house, um, to survey the situation, um, see where the risks are, where their opportunities are. Uh, some larger specimen shrubs are okay if they're placed well and if they're maintained very well. Um, so maintained well might be that they are thin, they're not you know, sh sheared down with hedge trimmers, but rather uh, made thin, lift the canopy up a little bit off the ground to, to prov uh, provide some vertical spacing. Uh, speaking of that, we do want to assure appropriate horizontal and vertical spacing, and I've got a couple of slides coming up on that, so I'll just let that go for a moment. Uh, arbor mulch under the plants is very beneficial for the plants. It helps conserve moisture and provides some, um, some food for uh, soil, <clears throat> soil organisms, but we don't want extensive use uh, across the whole landscape of wood arbor mulch. Um, we want to break that up again with pathways or other non-flammable materials. Um, we certainly want to avoid a kind of uh, wood material called gorilla hair that you've probably seen, that very, very fine uh, fibrous material uh, just burns so, so easily and, um, and also is very lightweight so it can catch fire and blow across the landscape catching other materials on fire. Uh, trees can be fine in the five to 30 foot zone if they're well pruned and if ladder fuels are avoided, those would be fuels underneath it that can allow the fire to build up into the, into the canopy of the tree. And again, wood fences present a, a risk. Uh, so we'd wanna avoid organic mulch, wood mulch right underneath them and also consider how to maybe break up the wood fence. So there's some panels of wood uh, mixed in with panels uh, that are open or that uh, have uh, metal or other materials. Um, we need to be creative about um, replacing wood fences with some other materials. A little bit more information about, um, about horizontal spacing. Um, this is sort of a classic diagram on the left that often um, is seen where, and, and it, the, the, the information is right in that we want to have a spacing of about two times the height of a plant to the next plant. But really what we can have is uh, is groupings of plants with two times uh, the height of the group as a whole uh, as space between the groupings of plants. Um, so I think this earlier uh, diagrams or ones that are commonly seen kind of led people to believe that they needed to have this very sort of a checkerboard uh, spacing of plants um, with just isolated, you know, shrubs or aloes or agaves on their own, um, you know, six or eight or 10 feet spaced apart through the landscape. Uh, really providing very little in the way of habitat. Uh, but we can apply that same idea to groups or islands of plants. The uh, spacing between the islands of plants should increase with, on steeper slopes. So you see that depicted here with a 4x or a 6x uh, spacing, again, x being the height of a, of a grouping of plants with these greater slopes. And it's important to keep the ground covered. This uh, earlier diagram you know, really kind of suggests that there's nothing on the ground. Um, but we know that uh, you know, roots and soil organisms uh, will benefit from having the soil covered with a, a wood mulch or where it's appropriate, a gravel mulch, but it could also be you know, a, a well irrigated, uh, low ground cover or something like that. <clears throat> Excuse me, vertical spacing um, is, the, uh, is avoiding fuel ladders by having appropriate, appropriate vertical space between the tree canopy and the vegetation beneath. 
So we're gonna do this to keep the fire from moving from a ground level up into the trees. We want to allow three times the height of the shrubs underneath um, between, uh, sorry, between the top of the shrubs and the lowest uh, tree limb. So a three times the height of the undergrowth in distance uh, above it up to the next tree limb. Uh, tree limbs uh, for mature trees should be at least six feet from the ground um, or can be a third of the height of the tree. If the tree there uh, then is only 12 feet tall, then, um, then there should be the they should be limbed up four feet from the ground and the, uh, any shrubs below it uh, you know, sufficiently low or, or, or removed. Uh, an example of some ladder fuel work that was done, um, uh, coordinated by, by Ellie and photographed here by Ellie Inslee. Um, this is some juniper under an oak tree where uh, the left on the left side shows the before picture where the trunk is you know, surrounded by junipers that are probably at a height of around five feet or so, four or five feet. And so work that was done is shown on the right where the, some plants uh, of the junipers that were uh, right close to the trunk were removed. So there's some space there now and the height of the junipers was also brought down so that we, we obtain that, uh, that vertical spacing that's required. Uh, a look into this juniper that re remains uh, shows that they also went to the trouble of removing any dead twigs, the accumulation of needles and things that often occurs in the center of a juniper plant. Here's a, fat, a ladder fuel removal project for somebody, um, you know, already a eucalyptus tree that is, uh, you know, prone, it has a lot of um, oils that are rather flammable. It's got a shaggy sort of bark that makes it more susceptible to catching on fire. Uh, and then it's, you know, laden with, uh, with ivy and has juniper up around the trunk of it. Uh, that, this needs some work. All right, uh, a couple more examples of defensible, of, sorry, of zone one before we move on. Um, these are some, uh, some designs by April Owens, and I thank her for, for sharing those with us. Um, so some nice groupings of native plants, um, but divided with some non-flammable material here, sort of a dry stream bed effect with boulders and some cobbles and gravel. Uh, a, a water feature, a bioswale, can be used not only to break up the path of fire, but also as a great way of sinking uh, stormwater into our groundwater supply. Uh, and here, a, a gravel path that provides that uh, sort of fire break between groupings of plants. All right, zone two. So zone one is lean, clean, and green in the sense that is, um, you know, there's spacing between plants. It's kept meticulously clean with respect to dead material. Uh, and it's well hydrated and, and plants are kept healthy. So that's what makes it lean, clean, and green. And we end up in space two, zone two, we want to continue uh, generally with that, um, with that same attitude. But we're able in zone two, given our distance from the structure, to have a little bit larger plants, a little bit larger groupings of plants. Uh, but we're going to continue to maintain uh, horizontal and vertical spacing between those islands of plants. We'll continue to have pathways to uh, break up uh, fire, so uh, non-flammable materials, uh, arbor mulch and leaf litter to around three inches is very desirable um, as it's you know, good for soil, good for plants. Trees are fine. If they're well pruned and ladder fuels are avoided and they're, they're healthy and certified to be healthy if necessary by an a uh, arborist. And this would be the part of the property where it would be appropriate to have to move that wood pile so that used to be against the house. We could put it in this zone, uh, but with nothing combustible nearby. So maintenance for both zones one and two, they're, they're more or less the same. We wanna keep it clean of clutter and debris. We wanna regularly remove dead and dry plant material. Although fallen leaves can stay during the winter and spring as they're good for soil health and they feed the earthworms, uh, but they would need to be removed during uh, summer and fire season. Uh, we should keep organic mulch uh, eight to 12 inches from tree trunks and wood fences and avoid plants and organic mulch close to structures such as decks and sheds. We're gonna keep plants well hydrated with an irrigation system that, um, that is efficient, works well, doesn't waste water by spraying onto, uh, onto hard surfaces. So a drip irrigation system is ideal. And of course the choice of native plants is also ideal as they are able to be healthy and well hydrated with a minimum of water. We wanna think about thinning shrubs and trees uh, as opposed to hedging them. So we don't want to uh, shear them down, which often creates a lot of dense uh, a, a very dense layer at, uh, at the top with a lot of dead material uh, and unhealthy shaded uh, material farther in. Rather, we're gonna thin out 
um, uh, individual um, branches of trees and shrubs uh, so that you can you know, sort of have the effect of seed through it. It re reduces the, the, uh, the mass of the plant in that way. If it's appropriate, uh, some plants are rejuvenated by cutting them down in the fall and, or, or winter. So I'm thinking of some of the natives, and I did this over the past weekend, uh, of California fuchsia, coyote mint, deer grass, plants like that uh, respond to well to that kind of treatment. And then you get a flush of new growth in the spring that is much less susceptible to, to fire. Now, if it's a larger scale project of removing vegetation, then timing becomes very important because there will be nesting birds during certain seasons. Uh, so substantial vegetation thinning or removal is best done in the months of September through February to avoid bird nesting season, which is March to August. Uh, there is the possibility of scoping out um, the, the plants to check for nests, but we want to be very careful of or be very aware of ground nesting birds as well if we do that. Plant selection is very important. And what about a firewise plant list? Well, I'm not going to produce one because there are very, very many plants that are uh, that are uh, very appropriate, but all plants at the same time will burn uh, if they become hot enough. So there will not be a firewise plant list. There will be a short list of some plants to avoid. And what it really comes down to uh, is the right plant in the right place. So most plants are fine. They just need to be uh, in the right place. So you can see in this image that I show here, uh, a plant that is not in the right place. This is far too large. This is a juniper, a Hollywood juniper planted just uh, 18 or 24 inches from the house. And our neighborhood uh, where I live in Napa here has many, many of these. It's unfortunate, uh, you know, these trees are now 30 to 40 feet tall in many cases. So not the right plant in the right place. So we want to consider how large is the plant going to grow? I used to work in a garden center when I was a, a youngster, it was my first job and I worked all through high school and college in garden centers. And so often people would come in and, and say that they need a plant for, you know, maybe it's for in front of the windows, one of these foundation plantings. Uh, so it can't get more than three feet tall. And they'll say, so how about this? <clears throat> and I'll say, well, that actually gets to about eight feet tall. And so, oh, well, we can prune it, right? And you would hear, hear that so much in the nursery industry, nursery industry, we can prune it, right? Uh, and well, technically, yes, you can, but there's a lot of reasons that that's not a very good idea. Uh, the plant isn't going to be happy and it's just setting yourself up for uh, so much more maintenance than is, is necessary. So how large will the plant grow? Will it thrive or it will be planted? Does it have enough sun or not too much sun, the right conditions for it, the right uh, soil moisture? Will it require more maintenance than can be provided either now or in the future? Again, kind of coming back to how large will the plant grow? And is it invasive? Unfortunately, many of our invasive plants in, in uh, wildlands, in creek corridors, for example, uh, have come into um, our area as landscape plants. Some plants uh, in particular I'd like to point out to avoid. Uh, pompous grass, of course, is, a, um, is used as a landscape plant, but is um, an invasive that has often escapes, especially near the coast. Um, and you can see it just grows so large and often has a lot of dead leaves in it. In this case, it's serving something as a ladder fuel into the tree above it. Bamboo is not a great selection. Um, it's often much more aggressive and, and larger than what people expect it to be when they purchase it. And they just, they create their own mulch by dropping uh, a ton of leaves at their base that are just difficult to keep, to keep clean enough. And junipers are not, you know, not universally bad by any means, there are probably some places for them, but right up against the house, right up under the windows is not one of them. They often grow, uh, or people often select varieties that are a little too large um, then they have to shear them down and, and that creates a condition of a lot of dead material in them. They also you know, kind of have uh, uh, some oils that, that make them especially flammable. So I recommend avoiding those plants. What about plants that, that are natives and that come from wildland areas that tend to burn? Uh, some of our chaparral species like manzanitas, like coyote bush. Well, they can be used if they are treated right. So they wanna be separated, have that horizontal spacing between others, not allow them to be uh, vertical or to be ladder fueled into trees above them. And at the same time, also don't allow plants under them to be ladder fueled. So keep a very low ground cover or, or remove plants from around the bases. Also, you'd want to, again, thin them out so you can kind of see the structure, which is you know, so beautiful, of course, in manzanitas, um, as opposed to pruning it by, by, uh, by hedging it. Um, here's another example, this one from my own landscape, where a western redbud, I'm gradually, as the years go by, growing it uh, to its full height, 
uh, and lifting the canopy up by removing lower, uh, lower branches, so it, uh, exposing the, uh, the trunks and making it a multi-trunked tree instead of a dense shrub. Uh, here's uh, some other images um, to, to show just some of my favorites that I think are particularly uh, useful in a fire, uh, fire wise landscape. We want to think a lot about native perennials for lawn replacements. This was my front lawn up until about five years ago or so. Uh, we want to think of perennials because they tend to be being more herbaceous. They had just have less material, woody material to burn, but there are some shrubs that would be fine as well. Um, and there are, you know, not, some of these are not herbaceous perennials, but I think some of the most useful plants for these landscapes are things like California buckwheat. There is Areogonum latifolium in the, again, I'm not sure if you can see my, uh, my cursor, but the image on the left towards the bottom with some fading now pink flowers, uh, the coastal California buckwheat. Uh, the yellow one in the center picture towards the back is uh, Areogonum umbellatum, the Shasta sulfur that a lot of people enjoy. Over here is some Areogonum grande rubescens in the bottom right corner. Uh, so those are great plants, just tidy little mounds of around 18 inches or so, uh, little tons of pollinators visiting those flowers. California fuchsia is shown in the big image towards the back uh, and with the red flowers, and it's just truly a, a hummingbird magnet. This is one of the most popular, I think, of the native plants in landscapes. And so I'm sure many of you are very familiar with it. Also grows to about that height of 18 inches. In this case, though, it does not look great in the wintertime and it does, um, it is very well refreshed by cutting it very low to the ground. I actually have an image coming up that'll show that. Coyote mint is this purple flower in the uh, center image, another fairly tidy plant at around 18 inches or so, and very popular with, uh, with butterflies, Lepidoptera and adults. Uh, I also like to use rushes and sedges. So in this case, I created a sort of a bioswale lined with boulders, uh, does collect some stormwater in the winter um, and allow it to soak in and sedges and rushes are just nice accompaniments in that, in, in that setting. Uh, there's deer grass in the landscape, um, not photo, uh, not pictured, but some of the other grasses I like are purple needle grass. Um, I also like uh, Calamagrostis foliosa. Um, Mendocino reedgrass, I believe, is a common name. We want to think too about uh, habitats specifically for Western, um, the Western monarch butterfly and some of the milkweed species. And I have some of those around the corner in this landscape. And Dudleyas, of course, are very uh, you know, photogenic plants that are very popular these days. And so I, I show a couple of the Dudleyas that I have in the landscape. Again, this is sort of facing the windows. Um, so, uh, you know, where I feel like uh, the, the landscape is really enhanced by moving the landscape away from the house and out just a little bit to where I can see it. Uh, and then uh, this is, I believe, the last of my slides. Uh, just real quick, uh, care of some of the native plants um, that, are, that I use in my landscape um, is kind of unique, uh, some, of the, um, some of the needs that they have for this, type of, for this time of the year. Uh, California fuchsia is shown here with its summertime blooms. This is what it looked like just a couple of weeks ago in my yard looking, yeah, not, 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 not great. Uh, but as we've talked about, it responds really well to cutting low. I use an electric uh, hedge trimmer to cut that quite low to the ground. And, um, and it, will, it, it is showing already the new growth and will come up with a flush of uh, very nice growth in the spring. Coyote mint can receive a similar treatment. I don't cut it down quite as low. Here it is in the summertime um, and before and after uh, a recent pruning just over this past weekend. With that, I thank you. Um, again, the other coalition members and myself are available for questions now. I thank you for the invitation um, and, and look forward to the discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you, John. I held that so beautifully. Um, so at this point, we hadn't said in the beginning to put your questions in the chat, although there have been some really good questions that have been answered in the chat. Um, so if anybody has questions, I dare to say unmute yourself and ask a question or write them in the chat. And then April, there, there was one in the chat about ground nesting bird season. Did you want to yeah. take one? I don't know about that, John. So is there a difference between ground nesting bird season and um, tree nesting bird season. I, I didn't 
I wasn't able to answer that question. No, I'm not enough of a birder myself. Um, yeah, I'm thinking of quail that I see so often running around um, uh, landscapes, not unfortunately in my own, which is a little bit too uh, much in the city uh, of Napa, but uh, outside in a little bit more rural areas or a little bit more interface with the countryside. Uh, yeah, quail are so so populous, and that's what I'm thinking of. And I <clears throat> assume their nesting season is through the spring, but I don't know the particulars of their timing. I can answer that. This is Ellie. Hi, uh, Ellie. Uh, <laughs> the um, bird nesting season for basically all species is uh, is uh, the beginning of March through. You know, you can hear different things, but but actually, some people say the beginning of February through the end of of uh, August. Um, the rule of thumb I have is basically the beginning of March through the end of August. So that's why we say the best time to do, mo you know, most of your, your pruning and trimming is before the end of February. And then, so, so basically the end of August through the beginning of, uh, the beginning of March. I, <laughs> so the birds are nesting the birds are nesting in the spring and summer, and, and it's pretty much the same for all species of birds. Thank you, Ellie, which looks like me, April Owens, but that's Ellie and Lee. Thank you for showing up. Mimi, other questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a uh, question from Shirley, with so much gravel and rocks being used, how do you keep weeds out without Roundup? Other methods? Question mark. I could speak to that for a moment. Um, so we always say these gardens are not, there's no maintenance, but there is maintenance. And so in my, I'm a, lands, I'm a landscape architect and do a lot of um, landscape install. So really it is like, it's making sure you prep the landscape first. We oftentimes use base rock. We don't, my, my company, we, we really lean away from landscape fabric. We use um, base rock as you know under pathways, and then use a little layer of pretty rock. I call it, but like crushed rock or whatever. And then you you definitely still have to to um, use weeding. Or I saw somebody could say said a propane torch. People get really cautious about any kind of fire in their landscape, as we talk. But in the winter time. Um, like in the spring, you can use that or um, horticultural grade vinegar. John, do you have any thoughts on that? Any more thoughts? Uh, I think a lot about weeds. It is the you know one of the the, the most time consuming parts of gardening. Uh, I do not use Roundup, haven't for many years, although I come from an agricultural background where I did use it. So I'm familiar with its use uh, and it works really well, but in my home landscape, I, I do not want to. Um, so I think about things like, uh, well, one thing I think of zero tolerance to the extent that it is possible, never allow a weed to set seed on your property. They will still come in from, you know, they'll blow in um, uh, from other properties. Uh, but if you can get to that point, then your workload is much, much less. So try very hard not to let weeds set seed. And after a few years of doing that, you'll find that, uh, that, that you've made a lot of, you've come, you've, it's much easier. Um, as far as how to do that, uh, there's hand pulling. Uh, that's a, a benefit of using wood mulch where it is appropriate is that I, at least I feel that you know you can use hand tools, you can use a good hoe. Uh, with gravel that just kind of mixes the gravel with dirt and things like that and isn't, isn't great. Um, so more delicate hand weeding in there. Uh, I use a lot of cardboard as a, I don't, I also agree that landscape fabric doesn't have a place in, in landscapes. Use a lot of cardboard, but under, under the wood mulch. Uh, and I do have a propane torch. Uh, use it only in the winter, except for you know maybe cracks in the you know, driveway or patio. Uh, but in the landscape, only in the winter time, and actually preferably on a drizzly wet day. Uh, and that will work, but only really with very tiny seedlings. Uh, once they get large enough, it's hard to kill them with a flamer as well. That's the best I can. Hopefully, offer. hopefully you'll see less volume of weeds um, if you've got a thick enough layer of the gravel. You know, it's keeping light out, so it's it's probably more seedlings that are being blown in. But yeah, there there will continue to be maintenance that's required for sure. Um, a somewhat follow up question to that in your image of I think, I think she means zone one. You showed the gravel path running between two landscaped areas that have arbor mulch. 
what are good ways to keep gravel mulch and arbor mulch from intermixing? April and John, do you have some ideas to share with the group on that? I'll just say real quick that I don't try very hard to keep them from intermixing because I think it kind of is a nice way. I would rather see that, uh, honestly, in most cases than a, you know, a, a rigid uh, metal edge that that creates this perfect, um, you know, distinction between the two. I don't, I don't have a problem with them running into each other. April, what do you think? Do you like that edge? I totally agree with you, John, and we're, that's why we work together. Um, but I, I love that soft edge, but sometimes people want like a real edge. And so oftentimes I use um, steel edging, um, which is a easily easy to install edging that can that lasts forever and can create that, that edge between mulch and, and gravel. Uh, next question, do you have a suggestion for books or publications that cover these issues, especially plant suggestions? I'm just going to look for one of my favorite. We'll you know. be sure, I mean, he probably has some, but we will make sure that we get some, some lists going. Um, and please check out our website. Uh, but uh, Mimi, do you have your favorites? Well, so first I'd love to promote the Resilient Landscapes Coalition website. And yes. there are some plant recommendations by zone on the Resilient Landscapes site. Um, we also, on the UC Master Gardener Program of Sonoma County, we also have plant lists um, for every possible situation, both native and non-native, but some really wonderful native plant lists as well. Um, my go-to favorite native plant book, which I'm looking for in my bookshelf to the left of me. Um, I don't know. I know you guys must have favorites, but I'm going to try to find my favorite. <laughs> I think it's one of I mean, So, uh, yeah, a lot, there's, there's some, like, I know we will look back to our, We're all looking in our there, um, but also on the CMPS Milo Baker chapter website and at CMPS state level website is a really important, there's a ton of great resources and also becoming a little promo. Like I know a lot of you may not be um, CMPS, California Native Plant Society members, but to be a member, it only is, I think it's $50 a year and you get a beautiful magazine, you get, and, and they have a wonderful website, but I really wanna promote people joining the, the Native Plant Society. You can join two chapters. So like I am a Milo Baker chapter member and then I also am a Warren County member and I get to go on those plant walks as well. So that's a good point to plug being a CMPF member. Uh, and if there's any other CMPF, CMPS members on the, on the, on the Zoom. Yeah, raise your hand. Favorite, hey, favorite book suggestions. Pop, feel free to pop it in the chat. I like a book called Native Treasures, and I'm afraid I would have to leave my seats to grab oh, it to find. I can, uh, I can see that in my book. <laughs> the, uh, the name of the it. author, but I like Native that one. Treasures. There's, there's some wonderful. Greg Rubin is a great, yeah. Native Treasures, sorry. It's there not it is. very well on the. <laughs> It's not going to come. That's through. a great one. There's a lot. I mean, our, our state is so large. There's so many great resources. So some books focus on Southern California and some on Northern California. Our chapter has a really fun thing coming that you guys, if you join and become members, you will start to get resources for sure. This new so book we're writing. We've got lots of chat uh, comments to catch up on, but I see okay. Chris Freeman has her hand raised. Chrissy, did you want to unmute and ask a question? Yeah. And then Erica, I see you too, Erica. Thank you. I only raised my hand because you asked if anyone else is a CMPF member to raise okay. their hand. I was going to say, if we're, if we're looking at books, um, after all these years, it's still my favorite book for um, designing a California landscape or uh, you know, figuring out what plants to use. Um, a, a book is Designing California Native Gardens by Glenn Keeter and Aubrey Middlebrook. That's it's a, a fabulous plant book. community approach to artful ecological gardens. Great it book. has such enduring value, this book. Mm -hmm. It does. I have a few yeah. gardens in that book. Yeah, it's a oh. lovely book. <laughs> April, oh, I never oh my gosh. That about what you. page are you on? <laughs> I, have, I have a couple like, um, of, yeah, 
I, I helped with that book and, and some of the books and, and some of the gardens in Marin County are. Oh, nice. So, awesome. That's a great book. And Alry and Lynn really focus on the plant community um, approach. Well, that's that's really cool. After two and a half years plus of working with April, I learned yeah, something. We all learned. Yeah. Erica, you had your hand yeah, up. Plant community effect. It, it, uh, the plant community approach. Um, it takes a go. long time to really absorb it, but the path is fabulous. Mm -hmm. awesome. Thank you, Chrissy. Erica, do you want to go ahead and unmute Erica? I just got from the library a book called Wild Suburbia. Um, talk a lot about Southern Cal, but it does have, it's like how to start introducing and redo your um, landscape with natives. And I'm sorry, I don't have the author right here. That's it. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the tip. Okay, back to the chat. Um, let's see, um, what should we do with our woody waste, um, i.e. tree trimmings without using carbon to haul it or chip it both uses carbon? And, and John, you spoke to that a little bit. Did you want to, do you have anything else you wanted to add on that? Uh, yeah, and I share the you know, the uh, the question. I don't. I, I'm I'm not sure what to do with that. So I, uh, for me, the best option right now is to put it in the yard waste bin. Uh, at least it's made into compost, and try uh, hard uh, to keep other carbon on the on the property as much as possible. I can speak to that a little bit. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks Jen. Yeah, there is another method. It is from Germany. It's called Hugel culture. And it's a method of placing woody material in a pile and putting soil on top of it. And so as things break down, they can feed that soil top and then you can even plant directly into that. So it's a way, you know, this would be obviously in a further away space, right beyond 30 feet, but it is a way to, you know, keep stuff on site and it can turn into a mound. And I've been using, I've been just playing around with doing, um, rain gardens in the 30 to 100 feet and, and leaving some limbs and some actually kind of big pieces like people culture-ish um, but on the top of the ground because birds love to feed on insects and little you know, bits in a, in a tree. So instead of leaving a tree that's declining, we've been leaving them on the ground um, in the 30 to 100, which is really fun to do. Okay, next, lots of uh, more comments to cover in the chat. We have large areas of dense ivy behind our house and in the woods. Their invasiveness aside, do they provide some protection from fire as a green, moist ground cover? Mm. Yeah, you know, we, we tackled that when we presented to um, uh, Fitch Mountain residents, um, uh, I don't know, a year or so ago, lots of dense stands of ivy in the Fitch Mountain community in Healdsburg. First of all, keep it out of your trees. Do not let it climb up your trees. That's going to create a fire ladder to move up to your trees. I think your bigger issue is really thinking about um, uh, maintenance, a kind of cleanup of it, you know, of any debris that's dropping in there and any woody debris that might be dropping in to the ivy, especially in closer proximity to the house. Um, you know, haven't seen anything specifically um, about, you know, you see suggestions of like a hydrated lawn in, you know, like maybe a native lawn in proximity to house can be, um, can be more reasonable. At least it's a low ivies. It's a low, um, uh, mostly herbaceous. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a real challenge, I think, for a lot of folks in, in Sonoma County. Anything? And, it, and it's so not a habitat, like it's not the habitat you want to create. Like, but it's what a lot of people are stuck with and I know, I know. brutal to remove. So it's so hard to remove. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's a good resource for native plants locally? Well, we have our fall sale with our CNCS. <laughs> um, we have a beautiful um, uh, nursery at uh, on the campus of the, the Laguna de um, Santa Rosa Foundation, like foundation. So it's usually in October. We all, um, I also recommend California Native, the California Flora Nursery in Fulton. Um, and then and in Sonoma, John, you want to talk about the Sonoma Ecology Center and your nursery? 
Yeah, it's a at Sonoma Ecology Center. We do have a small native plant nursery. A lot of what we grow is for our own restoration purposes, but we do try to uh, have uh, an excess and a particular species that are of interest to home gardeners and have a plant sale uh, often in the spring and in the fall. So we're working on planning a, a spring plant sale and we'll try to get that announced to you know this organization, for example, and other places where you'd, where you'd be able to hear about it. Well, I also want to say the more you get familiar with native plants, and we hope you do, um, they're wonderful. Um, uh, ask your local nursery um, to order them for you or to start carrying more of them. And the more people ask, you know, hopefully a lot more that we'll start seeing in, um, in, in more and more nurseries. But we do have some wonderful resources here in Sonoma County as well that John and April referred to. Um, I think we covered this question earlier, but I'm not sure if this came up after. April, why do you not use land landscape fact, fabric? Did we talk to that enough? Do you think on the lands? Why why that? I I wrote a little answer, and John okay. can probably back me up. But I, it's just when you think about the future of a landscape and how people are going to have to deal with what you put down, landscape fabric never goes away. And so I I can't tell you how many times we've come on a project with any iteration of landscape fabric, it doesn't go away and, you, and you're leaving that to the next generation. It also keeps um, any um, any mulch and any interaction happening to be between the mulch and the outside and the, the soil underneath. And so the things that we're learning about um, soil, it's so important to let that interaction happen. And so landscape fabric just doesn't let that happen. Mm -hmm. If you pull it up on a landscape where it's been installed for years, the soil just looks dead. It's mm -hmm. just amazing how it, it, it reduces that interaction and really kind of kills off the soil. Um, I feel like I need to let seedlings grow big enough so that I can tell if they are weeds or new annual wildfire plants that I want to grow. Any yeah. thoughts on sources to help us ID seedlings sooner or later? Um, I will say we, on the UC Master Gardener, um, uh, website of the UC Master Garden Program of Sonoma County website, we do have a list of some of the most common weeds. Um, uh, April or John, any any ideas on um, native seedling resources or pictures to help folks identify those? I mean, online, I think just Googling it would probably come up with some of them. I would also encourage people to try propagating their own um, their own native plants from their collection or from other, you know, from friends or other members of this organization. Uh, as many of them are pretty easy. I grow seedlings of many of the California buckwheat species, some of the grasses like deer grass, California fescue, purple needle grass is really easy. Coyote mint is really easy from seed. Um, so, you know, you could do that to produce more plants for your garden. You can also do it as a way of learning what the seedlings look like so that you, you know, can leave them where you, uh, where, where you might want them. And, and we've had this wonderful rainy year and I've, I've seen plants that I've never seen reseed themselves and maybe you too have too. Like coyote mint, I've never had them just reseed themselves on a landscape and they've just been going bonkers. So it's, it's, it's been beautiful to see the seedlings happening this year. Uh, next question. My first home came with a 25 foot fan palm. Thinking of skinning, I'm assuming you mean limbing up the bottom eight to 10 feet to reduce ember risk. Um, if you do have deadly, dead fronds that are hanging down that low, I would highly recommend that. Um, they from, they're, they're difficult to maintain because of the height that they reach, but I would, I would think as a ladder fuel, that would be a really smart maintenance move. Mm -hmm. Your comments? It's amazing that barn home. owls love palm trees. <laughs> yeah. So really just am. double think, you know, your treatment, like a lot of people are removing them and I, and it's just amazing for like that, that habitat resource. Uh, unrelated question to Sonoma Ecology Center. How can I join your native bee survey? I don't know if John or Ellie, if you have information you want to share about that. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the native bee survey. It sounds fascinating. Um, if uh, anybody would like to communicate with me, I can get you in touch with the right person. My email address is John K, so J O N K, at sonomaecologycenter.org. And I can get you uh, get you in touch with the right person. 
A great suggestion from someone to use the iNaturalist app for plant ID for the seedlings. Great suggestion. Lots of great comments about uh, why landscape fabric is not a good idea. Um, I think I caught everything. Any other questions folks have that they'd like us to address tonight? Michael, you can go ahead and unmute. Yeah, the, the, um, I was the one about the palm tree. Okay. And yes, the branches are all limbed way up. This is the little stubs that stay on the bottom, that stay at the bark. And they create, you know, really furry little pockets for embers. And I've seen a, a good um, landscape person that um, cuts those off in the dead area. He stops mm -hmm. before he gets to the what he calls the tender area where it's still growing. But it, since they're so flammable, those little stubs look like a real ember trap. Mm -hmm. Just wondering if you've ever heard of that or any comments about it. I've not run across that or of that maintenance practice. Have you, April or John, in your practice? Yeah, I have seen it recommended, and I, and I have seen it done in an Oakmont uh, residence, uh, skinning up the that you know that bit of uh, dead leaf that stays usually attached to the trunk, and so it is considered a good practice in a, you know, a high fire risk area. Okay, thank you. I think so. In general, you want to look at proximity to your structures. Um, uh, I'm guessing that's that's probably within your zero to 30 feet of your home. You need to consider your, you know, the severity of your um, fire risk in your area. There's lots of different factors to consider, but thanks for those thoughts. That's about 15 feet from the house. Amy, I see this this note up here. I love native plants, but they, are they more flammable than others because they are made to survive fire? Do you want to try that or you want me to start on that? I don't know. I mean, I just thought that would be, it's, it's important to address that comment. So uh, um, the, the approach we take from the University of California perspective, I can speak to this from UC's perspective, is that what John referred to earlier, all plants are flammable. Any plant is going to burn under the right condition. Um, if you're asking in the context of, um, uh, should I be using them in my home landscape because they're more flammable? It's we're, we're really trying to promote that really what you need to consider are those design principles of um, plant placement and, and creating um, separation between islands of plantings and, and implementing that zero to five foot uh, ember defense zone. So, um, you know, vilifying one plant over another um, uh, and thinking that, you know, if it's, you know, has less flammable characteristics um, that it's going to be okay to plant in, you know, in, in uh, and not follow those design principles um, is is um, is not the right approach in our opinion. Um, I don't know, April. Would you add more to that topic? Well, I, I I love this question. Like I love native plants, but are they more flammable than others because they are made to survive fire? John. Do you have thoughts on that? Because I, I do, but I, I just want to address, I, I want to hear your guys' thoughts. April, could you repeat the question? I was actually typing my email. I'm sorry, it's so hard to see in the, in, the, in the chat and there's so many, but I just, this is the question I think that should end the night. I love native plants, but are they more flammable than others because they are made to survive fire? They're made to survive fire. So I would just think like, native plants that have all these different all kinds of regimes like fire is one part of a regime of, of propagation for for native plants but there's so there's so many different habitats um and so many different plants that could that aren't in the fire regime and also using like manzanita we've talked about this so much manzanita coyote brush yeah they when they're burned they um, propagate better, but they also can be maintained in a different way that makes them safe and more habitat friendly. What do you think, John? Yeah, I don't, I don't have much to add to that. I agree that, um, you know, all plants will burn. Um, so the ones that come from a landscape that tends to burn, I don't think it necessarily makes it more flammable. Um, and I, I really believe that native plants um, have a great place in our landscapes are not, you know, I, I think the worst plants 
would be those would be some that and, and maybe it includes some um, you know some natives like chemise uh, with very fine like needle like leaves that create lots of debris um, that create that grow with lots of dead wood in them. Uh, I think coyote bush. Sometimes I see that that seems to be the case in a natural setting that it just grows with a lot of dead wood in it, but in a, a landscape it could be pruned. Uh, hard uh, every few years so that uh, the woodiness is diminished and it tends to grow uh, more of a lush growth or used with the right you know placement and pruning and, and things like that so that its fire risk is a little bit less but I would not apply it to like all natives generally. Well and there's actually so Cleo made a comment in the chat about wait if they're made to survive fire how are they more flammable and I don't think you can make a direct line of equation of that because they rejuvenate post-fire because they've they've you know, evolved in a fire regime in, in California, that doesn't make them more flammable. It just means that that's their evolutionary adaptive response to survive. Um, so thank you for that, that comment reference. And there was also a reference, um, there's a couple comments about manzanitas. Um, and I think these are really important to raise. But first off, I wanna say, there's a comment from Michelle about, it's all about fuel load and maintenance. Junipers are not native. I, I will say there is a native juniper a really lovely ground cover juniper that I have in my garden. Um, so um, there are native junipers. Um, it, it is about assessing, um, I mean, you really, I, I found after doing this work since the 2017 wildfires that um, you see, start to see your landscape through a different lens and you start to see, um, you know, where you might have more woody mass uh, in proximity to your home and structure and how you're maintaining it and how you can help maybe reduce um, uh, you know, it, your risk um, uh, and the risk of that plant during a fire. So it really is about um, how you maintain those plants. Manzanitas are beautiful if you, you keep an eye on the maintenance and snapping off the dead twigs that tend to develop at the lower part of the structure. Um, I've got some beautiful manzanitas in my yard that are starting to bloom and, and provide support for pollinators already. They're a really important um, pollinator plant because they're one of the earliest to bloom. I see um, that Rosaline really wants to speak, like she, Rose, oh, sure. and I think she, that she could speak to this too. Sure. I, I don't know what, I, I see her pop up. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to mention that a lot of the landscaping plants that we're going to be using, if they're not native, are adapted for other fire climates, other Mediterranean climates like South Africa or Australia, that by choosing non-native plants, you're just as likely to get a fire adapted species, which may or may not be more flammable, but that, uh, you know, most of our, our uh, landscaping plants are going to be Mediterranean climate, which are fire adapted. Thank you so much. I just think that's such a beautiful question. And I think that's why we, why we came together as a group. And so it's like such a beautiful way to end because. Well, and it's, it, so are we, do, can I just want to make a note that yeah. so there's, there's some interesting comments going on in the chat around Manzanita. Um, oh yeah, And, and a comment uh, that Not some that in, in the nun's fire, a bank of low growing manzanese actually stopped the, the progress of the low intensity of the fire that burned in the area. And they could see scallops of burn area around the, the manzanitas. So I think there's a lot of, you know, it's, a, it's, I think it's a nice argument about really considering um, uh, the design of your landscape and, and how and where you're using different heights of uh, trees and shrubs and ground covers and perennial versus woody. Um, we've got a lot. We're still learning, we're, ho we're hoping. And I saw a really lovely comment about, you know, that some of the design pictures from some of April's really beautiful work and, and, and from John's garden um, have helped you inspire you. But we're, we're still looking for more and more pictures. If you have some to share, please do. Um, uh, as we're all learning and adapting um, in, in the ways to be best designing our landscapes to be better prepared for, for future wildfires. Did you wanna close up April or? I, I, um, Leah, are you there? Or I could? Yes, yeah, Hi. just wanted to say thank you guys all for um, participating this evening. Really great questions. Thank you, John, for taking the time to share all of that information with us. Okay. Such great thing. I was taking pictures myself as I as I uh, looked at your slides. I appreciate all the information that you captured and shared. And um, Milo Baker, on behalf of the Milo Baker chapter, thank you 
um, all for sharing your knowledge with us. And I hope you have a good rest of your evening. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all for participating. Thank you so much. And yes, Rita, we can share the slides later. And if you go to the Resilient Landscapes Coalition website, you can also find, um, you'll find this and past recordings of our workshops as well, if you want to watch the longer two hour version. <laughs> it's SonomaResilientLandscapes.com. It's a little confusing until we change up, but um, Thank you all for joining so much. Thank you so much for inviting mm -hmm. or allowing outsiders to come in. This was fabulous. Oh, I'm so glad. And join CMPS. I love it. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Till next month. Thank you all so much.